Und ist hier. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Atlantic Talmud Stories, Outstanding Life Lessons. Tonight's topic is Who Laughs When Jerusalem is Burned? Uh, we want to thank uh, Joel, Joel and Adele Sandberg for dedicating tonight's class very kindly in honor of Joel's birthday, Mazal Tov. May God bless you with the Shnat Hatzlacha, successful year filled with good health, happiness, nachas, and lots of simcha. Thank you very much. Also, thank you to Aline Ginsberg. So tonight we are commemorating the yard site of the Shloishim of your mother, Reina Bat Eliyahu, Zichonal Livracha, may her neshama have an Eliyah, and be a source of great, great blessing and merit to your family, to our community, and to the world. Also, thank you to Shalva Ruth and Tamir Murray in honor of their son, Eitan Levi Murray's eighth birthday. He was born on the second day of Shavuot. And finally, Lilu Nishmat Carmela Bat Mesoda Zichonal Livracha and Lilu Nishmat Dvarafega Bat Shmuel Zichonal Livracha and Menachem Mendel Ben Elchanan Zichonal Livracha. May tonight's learning be a merit for all the things that we're thinking about, commemorating, and celebrating. Uh, thank you, everybody. And if you want to dedicate one of these classes, there's a link in the video description, which uh, you can click on that, and that'll help us continue to do what we're doing. Also, the link to the source sheet is uh, in the video description. Tonight, we're studying from two different sections of Talmud. We actually have three stories. Uh, pretty outlandish stories with pretty outstanding lessons. So let's get right into it. Make a little l'chaim on the coffee before we begin. L'chaim, everybody. For the past few days, we've seen some really disturbing, painful images coming out of Israel. And yesterday was the image of the fire burning on the Temple Mount behind the Kotel, the Western Wall. And as Jewish people, when... Um, when we see fire burning on the Temple Mount, even if though we're not 2,000 years old ourselves, but in our subconscious memory and imagination, there's a lot of trauma seeing those images because that's what happened nearly 2,000 years ago when the Romans destroyed our temple and murdered millions of Jewish people and exiled hundreds of thousands and brought complete destruction to Israel. That's what happened 500 years before then when the Babylonians came and destroyed the temple and did the same by murdering and exiling and imprisoning so many of our brothers and sisters, our ancestors. So there's a lot of chaos going on in Israel right now and um, we're all getting reports from family, from friends uh, who are, have to be bunkered down in their, in their bunkers, in their shelters. And um, it's, it's a very scary time. And we're learning and we're praying that God should give Israel's leaders the wisdom and the courage they need to be able to guide the army and the security forces and the people in a way that is best for Israeli citizens and the Jewish people, to keep them safe, to keep them out of harm's way. And there's no need, now's not a time to think about uh, things that are not important, uh, other things that are distracting. Now it's time to think about the duty and the duty is to keep the Jewish people and the people of Israel safe. May God bless their efforts. May there be no more injury, no more pain, no more loss of life, and may calm and peace be restored. And we always wish there should be ultimately peace. That's what we want, that's what we pray for, and we believe it could happen. So on that note, you know, you see Jerusalem burning, and it makes you cry, and it moves you to tears, and it's very painful and traumatic, like I said. However, somebody laughs at all this. And the question is, what is then a laugh about? And who is this person laughing? And what can we learn from this reaction about laughing at everything going on? And that's something that I want to go on a journey tonight. It's a 2,000-year-old journey in the Talmud. And I have two sources. One source is from Talmud Chuli 91b. And then the second source on side two is from Makot 24a to b. Let's get straight into the story. Story number one goes like this. Rabbi Akiva said, Rabbi Akiva, who lived after, during and after the destruction of the Second Temple in the first and second century after the Common Era, and this is a story that happens after the destruction of the Temple, 
And he says as follows, I asked the following question of Rabbi Gamliel and Rabbi Yeshua in the meat market in the town of Emmaus, where they went to purchase an animal for the wedding feast of Rabbi Gamliel's son. So they're busy shopping for meat. And Rabbi, Gamliel, Rabbi Kiva says, here's the question that I have. What's the question? What's on your mind when you're in the meat store? This is what was on Rabbi Kiva's mind. It says in the verse about Yaakov, about Jacob, if you recall the story, he spent 22 years away from his home, running away from his brother Esau, who was trying to kill him. And so he travels to Haran. Haran is the home of his uncle Lavan. And he spent 22 years there. He doesn't have a very pretty experience. He works very hard. But he manages to find his four wives, which he marries, and he gives birth to his children, his family, which will become the future of the Jewish people. And finally, after 22 years, he thinks maybe it's time, maybe it's safe to come back home. Maybe Esau has forgiven him. And so it says in the verse there, uh, and the sun shone for him when he passed Peniel and he limped upon his thigh. So on his way back, he meets an angel, an angel who tries to kill him and he wrestles with the angel and he gets injured and his thigh is dislocated and he's limping, but he defeats the angel. And then the Torah says the sun rose. For him. For him. So Rabbi Kiva's question is, did the sun only shine for him? Didn't it shine for the entire world? <laughs> Suns don't shine for one person. It was like when it's light. You can't light a candle just for me. If, you know, that's the beautiful metaphor of light. If I turn on the light, it's for everybody. Okay, that's the famous example. If, if it's a cold room. So do you put on a coat? And then you're just protecting yourself. Or do you light a fire? And then you're warming yourself up, but everyone up, else up together with you. Two kinds of people in life. So if the sun is shining and rising, it rises for everybody. What does the Torah mean that the sun rose for Yaakov? So what's, what, what's the answer? So Rabbi Kiva said, I have an answer that I heard from Rabbi Yitzchak. And it goes like this. The verse means that the sun, which set early exclusively for him, also shone early exclusively for him, in order to rectify the disparity created the pre by the premature sunset. What's happening here is reminding you of something that happened much earlier. There was a premature sunset that happened for Yaakov earlier, and now the time zones and the orbits of the sun got all out of whack, out of balance. And so to make up the orbit, to bring it back to a state of balance, there had to be a premature rising of the sun as well, for Yaakov. What was the premature sunset and the premature sunrise that the Gemara explains? The Gemara says, if you recall the story, it is written in the verse, and Jacob went out from Beersheba and went towards Haran. So when Jacob begins his journey, escaping from his home, leaving the home of his parents, Yitzhak and Rivka, uh, leaving the threat of Esau trying to kill him, and now he's traveling to Haran. So there's an interesting verse. The verse says, uh, thereafter, it says, and he, he encountered the place, listen to this word, he encountered the place, and he slept there because the sun had set. That's a verse in Vayetze. What does it mean you, to encounter a place? And it's saying, and he slept there because the sun had set. So all of these interesting phrases, the Gemara says, there's actually a whole back-end story going on over here, which the Torah doesn't talk about. And that is as follows. Actually, because where is this happening? Where is Yaakov sleeping? Remember, he sleeps and he, falls, and he puts the rocks around his head. Where is this happening? You know where? It's on a mountaintop. Which mountain? The Temple Mount. Which where Abraham prayed there, Har Maria, and then Yitzchak was there. Now Yaakov is there. But the story goes like this. Really, Yaakov left Beersheba, left his parents, and he made it all the way to Haran, which was the home of his uncle Lavan. But when he got to Haran, he had regret. And he said, is it possible that I passed a place where my fathers prayed and I did not pray there? How could I just pass by the mountain? It's my place where my father, my grandfather, they stopped there, they prayed there, and I just ignored it. He was so disappointed, he said, I've got to go back. It's a long journey. It took a while to get to Haran. Now he's got to go back who knows how long. So the, so the Talmud explains, when he set his mind to return, God made a miracle, and the land contracted for him. Um, we call it in Hebrew, he had this uh, quick passage 
of, of a journey, a journey that could take a very long time, happened to him very quickly. As the commentaries explained, somehow beneath his feet, the earth sort of folded up and contracted what normally is many, many, many miles. All of a sudden, there's a quick journey for Yaakov. And that's why the verse says, bamakom, he encountered the place. You don't, what do you mean you encountered? You're traveling and you meet places. He encountered in a strange way. This is a place that was supposed to be, take a long time to get there. And within minutes, he's there. God made a miracle. And he arrives at the mountain. And therefore, the verse says he encountered the place, indicating that he arrived there miraculously. Now, what does he do when he gets there? He learns from his father and grandfather. Avraham prayed there. Yitzhak prayed there. He's also going to pray there. So he prays. And when he finishes praying, he says, okay, now I'm going to go back to Haran, because that's where I've got to hide out to save my life. As he's about to return back to Haran, the Holy One, blessed be he, said, this righteous man came to my lodging place, and he will depart without remaining overnight. You know, a guest comes to your home. You're already here. You're not going to stay for a few days. You're leaving. Hashem was so excited that Yaakov's visiting the Temple Mount. And that's it. You come for five minutes, you pray, and you leave. Hang out. I want you to spend the night here. But Yaakov, what do you mean spend the night over here? It's the middle of the day. The sun is shining. And Yaakov is a guy that doesn't waste any moments. He's not going to... He didn't have a phone to play games and catch up on emails. What's he going to do for the next six hours of the sunset? He's bored. He wants to go back to Haran. He's afraid of Esau catching him. So Hashem made a miracle. Immediately the sun sets before its proper time so that Jacob will stay overnight in the place. Hashem made the sun set, so it became nighttime really quick. Then he put out, that's the story in the, in the Torah. Then he puts out the stones around his head. He goes to sleep. He has his dreams. We'll talk about his dreams going up to heaven. Wakes up in the morning. And then continues his journey to Haran. So here we have the episode 22 years earlier when the sun set prematurely for him, which is a very nice miracle of God wanting Yaakov to stay there overnight. However, cosmically, it caused a very big imbalance in the orbit. I mean, for 22 years, things were out of whack. Not that, I mean, you know, in those days, they didn't have such precise um, calculations of seasons and times. And you know, today would affect us much more. Then I don't know who it affected, really a few hours of an uh, imbalance of the sun. But the fact is there was something imperfect in the world. So Hashem is always thinking one day we have to perfect and bring the cosmos and the sun back to balance. When does he do it? 22 years later, when he fights with the angel, then the sun rose early. So the sun that, pre that, 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 that set premature for him now rose premature for him. And that's the Gemara. Now, let's understand this. Let's ask a few questions. First of all, I get that there's these verses in the Torah, one verse that talks about it setting prematurely, one verse it's shine, it's shine, rising prematurely. I understand that. But what really is going on over here? What does it really mean that a sun sets premature and a sun rises prematurely? All for Yaakov. What's, what's the real meaning of what the Torah says, but how do we make sense of it? That's question number one, an obvious question. Question number two. The, the Talmud is very specific to tell us the context, the background of this story. Where did the story take place? In the meat marketplace. Why is that an important piece of information? It could have, the, the Talmud could have said, Yaakov stood up one day and he tells his uh, colleagues, I have a teaching to tell you. Question and answer, no. We have to tell you that it happened in the marketplace when they're shopping for me to prepare for the wedding of Rabbi Gamliel's son. Why is that an important piece of information? Number three, when you're shopping for meat, when you're shopping in the supermarket, there are many kinds of conversations you could have. It's a good time. It's a nice date to go out with your loved one. You know, you, spend, you, don't, you don't get a chance to spend so much time with each other. Let's go shopping in Winn-Dixie together. Yeah, some of the most beautiful moments are walking up and down those aisles and buying everything that you don't need, but one day you think you're going to need, and you, know, you know how it goes. Why were they talking about this? Why did this come up in Rabbi Kiva's mind that, whilst they're shopping for meat? Let me tell you the story of Yaakov, the sun rising, the sun setting. What's the connection to the meat market? Now, the truth is, by the way, that elsewhere in the Midrash and other sources, this story is also repeated, and there it says a number of other Pretty bizarre teachings, but also taught, also taught by Rabbi Akiva. So Rabbi Akiva was in a mood to teach pretty bizarre things. But why this one? Now, some of the commentaries learned from here something, a very important lesson. That even when you're shopping down the aisles of Winn-Dixie, it's okay to talk 
words of Torah. You don't have to talk only Lashon Hara. <laughs> you can also talk about something you studied today. You can also ask a question on the Torah portion. So that's a beautiful lesson in general, how to use our time meaningfully with our loved ones or those we're hanging out with. But still doesn't answer the question why specifically this conversation, this question and answer about the sun rising and setting for Yaakov. One final question. These rabbis, Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Gamliel was the head of the Sanhedrin, the head of the great Supreme Court, Rabbi Yeshua, these were leading rabbis of the time. When you go shopping in the supermarket, it's not very often that you find the leading rabbis, leading Jewish, of, <laughs> Jewish leaders of the time shopping. Normally, we assume or we hope they're busy and they don't have time to shop. So they have people to shop for them. And we respect that because we trust that they're doing something more important with their time. You don't think that Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Yeshua could have had somebody else doing the shopping for them? Are they the big experts in meat, which cut and which slice for the wedding? I mean, I'm sure maybe their wives or maybe the, the, the caterer, somebody could have done a better job than them. Why did they have to do the shopping? So those are some questions about the story. So let's try to figure this out. First, some context. What's going on in Jewish history? This is during the second century after the Common Era. This is happening during a time that we've spoken about in previous weeks a few times. During the reign of Hadrian. Hadrian Emperor Hadrian, or in the Talmud is called Andrinus, who was one of the most brutal, vicious, wicked Roman emperors to the Jewish people. And he made every effort to bring total destruction. Not only renaming Jerusalem into a Roman city, not only grazing the whole Temple Mount a thousand feet down so it shouldn't be a, a tall mountain anymore, but he's outlawing Torah and mitzvot and circumcision and Shabbat and Rosh Chodesh and festivals and Torah learning. I mean, he's outlawing all the mitzvot and if you were caught doing these things, you'd be killed. He's the one, in fact, who orchestrates the ten martyrs which you read about in Yom Kippur and Tisha B'Av, 10 leading rabbis, he didn't just kill them, but he brutally kills them. We only have a description of some of them because some of them it's even too painful to record in history. Whether their skin was flayed, whether they were burned at the stake, surrounded by a Torah scroll, whether they were fed to the dogs, whether craziest things happened to them. One of them being Rabbi Akiva himself. One of them being the son of Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Shimon, who were preparing for his wedding over here. He was also killed. So this is a really, really difficult time. In fact, the Talmud says a very harsh comment. The Talmud says, it was during this time the sages gathered and there was a sense of hopelessness. I mean, the temple's been destroyed and the Jewish sovereignty has been destroyed and Jews have been killed and there's not so many left and they've been spread out all over the place. This is before technology's times. How are you gonna keep the Torah going? How are you gonna keep anything going? I mean, there's no schools, there's no education, there's no pizza stores, there's no kosher life, there's nothing. So there's a sense of helplessness. And many, in fact, thought, it's hard to say these words, thought that the Jewish story is over. And probably that's how it seemed. And so suggestions were raised in the Bet Medrash and the study halls, which maybe we should outlaw eating any meat anymore. How could we eat meat? We're sitting in exile. So many of our ancestors were killed. We should outlaw drinking any wine. There was even a suggestion we should outlaw no more having children. Could you imagine? No more having children. One of the rabbis raised that suggestion. Why? Because why sh what's going to happen? It's only, it's only a matter of time before we all get killed. So why should we let them kill us? Let's kill ourselves. Let's, not have, let, let's, let's end the story ourselves. If it has to end, let's end it with dignity, so to speak. This is... If you can imagine survivors after the Holocaust, some of them at least, the way they spoke. I remember when I was a student, uh, for the first time I traveled away to Yeshiva in London, in England, in the Yeshiva there. And we used to travel, I think it was about once a month for a Shabbat, to different cities and different synagogues, different communities, every once a month to have a Shabbat off, as we call it, but also to see and to help and to... So we were on this train and we met this elderly Jew, a Holocaust survivor. I was a young boy, I think I was 17. And we were talking to him and he was, looked like a very lonely person who was by himself. And he said, he never got married. 
because he didn't want to have any children. Because after what he went through in the Holocaust, how could he bring children into this world? For what point? If they should get killed eventually, he gave up on the whole story. And that wasn't just him. Many people thought like that. When we take when my grandparents and your grand, other grandparents actually went and got married and had children and built families, don't take it for granted. What kind of hope did they have when they did it? Now, the suggestion was never actually accepted. And there's different explanations why, either because it was not, it's too, it's too uh, unreasonable to demand of people to stop having children and stop getting married, or we decided we have to have faith in God and do the right thing no matter what, whatever the reason. But that just explains to you the mood of the time during those days, a mood of absolute helplessness and hopelessness. Now, once we understand that, let's turn to source number two. This is the end of the tractate of Makot, 24a and b. Two similar stories, unbelievable stories. Story number one. It was once that Rabbi Gamliel, Rabbi Lazar ben Azaria, Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Akiva. So three of the same characters as the previous story, but now with the addition of Lazar ben Azaria, you probably remember him. He was the 18-year-old who was appointed to be the head of the court after the previous head was deposed. And now they were walking along the road in the Roman Empire. So these rabbis, we know they were famous statesmen also, and they often made visits to Rome to try to negotiate and lobby for the Jewish people to the Roman emperor, the Roman government. Now they're walking through the city of Rome, and they heard the sound of the multitudes of Rome from Puteoli. I think the city, it's a city, I looked it up today, the city, it's called today on Google, it's called Putsu, with a Z, Putsuoli or something. And it's a city near Naples, which is hundreds of miles away from Rome. But they heard noise coming from there at a distance of 120 mil. And the noise was the noise of vibrance and activity and celebration. The people of Rome are strong, they're thriving. It's a bustling economy and environment. So when they're walking in Rome, and they're here, they're, their people are in exile, the people have been destroyed, Rome is thriving, and so these sages begin weeping. And Rabbi Akiva begins to laugh. They said to Rabbi Akiva, what are you laughing about? It's not a laughing matter to see our enemies who have killed our own grandparents, our own friends, our own siblings, our own communities, you know, imagine, imagine after the war, after the Holocaust, Jews were roaming the streets of Berlin and for some reason Nazi Germany was still alive and, and, and thriving. What are you laughing about? So Rebbe Kiva says to them, what are you crying about? Why are you weeping? So they said to him, these Gentiles who bow to false gods and burn incense to idols and they've destroyed our people, they dwell securely and tranquilly in this colossal city. Victor, here you go. They, 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 um, they dwell securely and tranquilly in this colossal city. And for us, the house of the footstool of our God, the temple, is burned by fire. And we shall not weep. Our enemies are up. We're down. We don't have a home, to, a, a land to call our home. We don't have a temple. We don't have a house of God to, to worship to God. That's why we're crying, obviously. So Rabbi Kiva said to them, well, that's why I'm laughing. If for those who violate his will, in other words, the wicked people, it is so, and they are rewarded for the few good deeds they perform, if even the enemies are living such a life, such a good life, then Rabbi Kiva said it only makes sense. How much more so for those who perform God's will, all the more so they're going to be rewarded. Yes, says Rabbi Kiva, I can also cry. I understand the distraction, the devastation. I'm aware of that. But just think about it. The Romans of all people who have gone against God and gone against God's people and destroyed his home and destroyed his land, and they're thriving. Well, how much more so? We will also thrive even more one day because we are living in accordance with God's will. That was Rabbi Kiva's perspective. Story number two. On another occasion, 
They were ascending, same group of people. They were colleagues. They traveled together all the time. They were ascending to Jerusalem after the destruction of the temple. Because they didn't live in Jerusalem. No Jews lived in Jerusalem. In fact, Jerusalem became a Roman city. What was it called? Uh, Ayala Capitolina or something like that. Rabbi Kiva lived in, in Bnei Brak, and Rabbi Yeshua lived in Pekin, and, and others lived in Lod, in other places. No, no, Jerusalem was, was, was Judenfrei, as we say. So they're approaching Jerusalem. When they arrive at Mount Scopus, which is the mountain right outside there, and they saw the site of a destroyed temple from a distance, what did they do? They tore their garments. They did Kriya, which, by the way, is the law. Nowadays it says, when you visit Jerusalem, depends where, it could be when you visit the Mount Scopus, or a little closer, the, the old city, or the Western Wall, you're supposed to tear your garments. People do that today. When you see the holy space of, of, of the temple destroyed. A lot of people have this, um, are very careful about visiting the Kotel, for example, when they arrive in Israel uh, on a Friday before Shabbat or on a Rosh Chodesh or on a festival day because the first time you visit the festival day, then you don't have to tear your garment. And if you visit on a regular Monday, you would have to tear your garment. And others go anytime and actually tear their garments. Not every time you visit there. When the first time or the first time in a long time, you have to tear your garment. So they tear their garment. They continue their journey and they arrive at the Temple Mount. And there they see a fox emerges from the sight of the Holy of Holies. And now they begin weeping once again. And now Rebbe Kiva begins laughing once again. And the story repeats itself. They say to him, Rabbi Akiva, how could you be laughing when a fox is roaming in the space of the Holy of Holies? And Rebbe Kiva says to them, but what are you crying about? So they say, of course we're crying. This place, the Holy of Holies. It's written in the verse, and the non-priest who approaches shall die. This was a place that only one person, called the high priest, could enter into that space once a year. And any other person who entered that space, or even if the high priest entered that space not on Yom Kippur, right away you died, that was the punishment. Even high priests on Yom Kippur sometimes died if they didn't you know, perform what they were supposed to do and behave appropriately. And now, in this place, a fox walks in it. Shall we not weep? Of course we're crying. Rabbi Akiva said to them, that is why I'm laughing. And listen to Rabbi Akiva's explanation. In the prophecy of Isaiah, the prophet of Yeshayahu, we know Yeshayahu from his name. His name means Yeshua, which means salvation. Yeshayahu is the source of many prophecies of the future redemption. Right? On Pesach a few weeks ago, we read about his prophecy of what will happen when Mashiach will come. He has many prophecies about the redemption, but he also has prophecies about the destruction. So it says there as follows. In chapter 8, verse 2, it says, I will take to me faithful witnesses to attest. Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. He's linking two prophets together, Uriah and Zechariah, and saying both of these prophets are my witnesses. Now, here's the question. How can Uriah and Zechariah both serve as witnesses to whatever they're testifying? It doesn't make any sense. Why? What is the connection between Uriah and Zechariah? Uriah lived during the time of the first temple. Zechariah lived during the time of the second temple. There's probably a few centuries that separate the lives of these people. They never saw each other, of course. How do, the, how do these two people ever serve as a witness? To be two witnesses, you have to be showing up at the place at the same time. Two, right? You can't live in different time zones uh, or different uh, eras and be two witnesses. So what does Yeshayahu mean that, that, that they are the faithful witnesses? So Rebbe Kiva says, I'll explain to you what this verse means. And this is a very novel teaching he gives. He says, the verse established as follows. The fulfillment of the prophecy of Zechariah is dependent on the fulfillment of the prophecy of Uriah. Uriah gave one prophecy in the times of the first temple. Zechariah gave a prophecy in the times of the second temple. When Yeshayahu, Isaiah says that these are two faithful witnesses, he's saying their two prophecies are dependent on each other. Zechariah's prophecy during the time of the second temple cannot be fulfilled unless Uriah's prophecy from the first temple is going to be fulfilled. That is something, that's a prophecy that Yeshayahu had. 
that you have to have first number one, and then you can have number two. Okay, that's the formula. Now, what were their prophecies? As follows. In the prophecy of Uriah during the first temple, it says as follows. Therefore, for your sake, Zion will be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem shall become rubble, and the temple mount is the high places of a forest, where foxes are found. Uriah tells the Jewish people, and like many prophets told them, Yirmiyahu and other prophets told them, but they didn't want to listen. But he told them over and over again, if you don't stop behaving, that's it. The destruction is coming. Now, in the, destruction, in the prophecy of Zechariah, what does it say? Very famous verse. There shall yet be elderly men and elderly women sitting in the streets of Jerusalem. Beautiful prophecy. Zechariah says, Oid yeshvu zekenimu zekenot. Old men and women will walk the streets of Jerusalem. Yiladim v'yadot mesachkim. There'll be young children, boys and girls, playing ball in the streets of Jerusalem. Etc., etc. Many songs have been made. Such a beautiful verse, which, by the way, 67 years ago, no one could imagine what that means. Today, you take a visit to Jerusalem and you walk on a Shabbat afternoon in the neighborhood and you're seeing the unimaginable the young boys, the young girls, their babas, their zaydas, the, the streets are bustling. This is the prophecy of Zechariah coming alive. So, Uriah gives the prophecy of destruction, Zechariah of, of, of redemption. So now, based on what Yeshayahu said, that the two witnesses are depend on each other, Rebbe Kiva explained, until the prophecy of Uriah with regards to the destruction of the city was fulfilled, says Rebbe Kiva, I was afraid that the prophecy of Zechariah would not be fulfilled. If it's not going to be a destruction, we'll never have Zechariah's prophecy of young and old, once again thriving in the streets of Jerusalem. Now that the prophecy of Uriah was fulfilled, it's evident that the prophecy of Zechariah remains valid. When we see the fox roaming in the place of the Holy of Holies, and when we see how the Temple Mount has been raised, and when we see the level of destruction, says Rebekah, I know that Zechariah's prophecy will be fulfilled. And one day, I don't know when, but it's coming. And that's why I'm laughing, because I don't know it's a real prophecy right now. So how did, the, how did his colleagues react? So they turned to him and they said, Akiva nichamtanu, Akiva nichamtanu. Akiva, you have comforted us. Akiva, you have comforted us. Rabbi Akiva had this unbelievable talent, nature, disposition. Rabbi Akiva could look into a war zone he could look into a place of destruction. And what you see, destruction, and you see sadness, and you see tragedy, and you see death, and you see sorrow, he sees something else. He sees old men, old women, living, living, living healthy long years, walking in the streets. He sees, sees children dancing in the streets. He sees temples, temples being rebuilt. He sees Jews from all over the world coming back and in the thousands and the millions. He sees all of the prophecies happening in front of his eyes. He sees it. He sees it at a place where someone else, all they see is just the fox and the holy of holies. Not because he's naive. Not because he's ignoring the reality. Trust me, Rebbe Kiva also shed a tear or more tears. He also cried on Tisha B'Av. He also fasted on Tisha B'Av. But he saw more than that. That's what, amazing, what was amazing about Rebbe Kiva. Rebbe Kiva understood that it's true. God might be concealed, but he's not dead. And the evil forces might be very powerful, but they're not eternal. And the tyranny of the Romans might be all pervasive, but it's not everlasting. That's what Rabbi Kiva understood. In other words, he saw that even though if the sun has set, but at some point, the dawn will break and the sun will once again rise. That's the metaphor of Rabbi Akiva. So now we go back to our meat story. Remember the story we first learned about the meat? What's happening? Let's again describe the scene. Rabbi Gamliel is making a wedding for his son. Rabbi Gamliel may have been filled with a lot of doubt. 
like any Holocaust survivor, like anybody living back then. I'm marrying off my son, I'm spending all this money, this effort, he's gonna marry what? He's gonna have children, I'm gonna have grandchildren, and then what? And then the Romans are gonna come back and kill us again. So he's preparing for the wedding, but with mixed emotions. More than that, it's much more, why? Who was Rebbe Gamliel? Rebbe Gamliel, who was the head of the Sanhedrin, came from a very prominent family. A family, a lineage of leaders of the Jewish generation for a very, very long time. In fact, it's his family that we are told were rooted to the family, the offspring of David HaMelech. And the rulership, the kingship was given to the tribe of Yehuda, the tribe of Judah, David HaMelech. And now many, many centuries later, now it's the family of Rabbi Gamliel, who's the head of the Sanhedrin. It was so important, that family was very important. Why? Because David HaMelech, the, the soul of Mashiach, the soul of the ultimate redeemer, comes through the tribe of Yehuda, David HaMelech's family. That's where kingship is, and you have to keep that family going, because one day the soul of Mashiach will come through that family and come about and re bring redemption to the Jewish people, to the whole world. In fact, when the second temple was being destroyed and it was uh, General Vespasian was heading the siege around Jerusalem, and you may know the famous story, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, he was the leader of the people at the time, he faked his death, he managed to get out of the city gates, he said he wants to speak to the emperor, and the emperor he was very impressed by a certain thing, so he offered him three requests. What did, what did uh, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai ask for in his three requests? So one of them he asked for, you're going to destroy Jerusalem, but give us another city, give us the city of Yavne. We can rebuild the yeshiva in Yavna. We can rebuild Jewish life there. Okay, granted. There's a rabbi, Rabbi Tzadok, who's been fasting for 40 years because he's afraid of a destruction. He's been praying. He's very sick. We need medical help from Rome. Bring some medicine for him. Fine, granted. And his third request was, do not touch. Make sure to spare the family of Rabbi Gamliel. There were many great rabbis at the time. But he requested to spare and don't touch this family. Why? Because if you have to kill, don't kill him. Because he is our family line from David HaMelech. He's the family line, this is what it says, that was going to bring the soul of Mashiach into this world. We need him. We need his family's descendants. That's how important his family was. Now he's making a wedding for his child. So all the sages want to participate in preparing this wedding. It's a very exciting time for the whole community. They don't send their maids to go shop. They want to go shop. Why? This is a very important wedding. This is the offspring, the children of Rabbi Gamliel, who is going to carry the soul of Mashiach and bring about redemption at the right time for the Jewish people. It was a very exciting event. But Rabbi Gamliel and others in the back of their minds are pretty uncomfortable over here. What really is going to be in the future? With that mixed emotions doing the shopping in the meat market, Rabbi Akiva says, I have something to tell you guys. Because he sensed their their doubt, and he sensed their confusion, and he sensed their uncertainty. And Arab Kiva says, let me tell you something. I wanted to tell you the story of Yaakov. Yaakov was somebody, and this goes back to the whole discussion that they had. Yaakov was somebody who had to leave his home and be all alone. His brother wanted to kill him. He leaves the holy space of Yitzchak and Rivka. That's where a child wants to grow up. I was a young adult. He wants to be with his parents. No, he's got to run away. He's got to be alone. He owns nothing. He doesn't have a penny to his name. He has to go now to the house of Lavan. Lavan did not have a good name, good reputation. Lavan was a nasty guy. Not a place where you want to live. What's he going to do there? He's going to have to work very, very hard over there. And he knows he's going to be cheated. And he's going to work as, be as honest as he can. But Lavan cheats him. Yaakov knows on this journey where he's leaving Israel and he's going to Haran, he knows, as it says, he, he, he goes to the mountaintop and what happens? The sun set. Remember, God makes the sun set for him. What does it mean the sun set? Not just physically the sun set because God wants him to sleep there that night. It's more than that. Metaphorically, the sun set on him. He was now going to a world of great darkness. He was going to a future of great uncertainty. Is he even going to have a life? Is he going to stay alive? Will Esau catch him or not? Maybe Lavan will, will destroy him. He doesn't know what's going to be. And he's not a young man anymore. He has to get married. He has to have a family. He has no idea. He's going into exile. His face is darkness. 
as he's going onto this journey to darkness, how does he react? How does he respond? He could have raised his hands in the air and said, God, I give up. What do you want from me? I'm trying to listen to my mother and take the blessings, and now I'm being haunted and, and persecuted. And He doesn't do that. He throws himself in there. First of all, in that sleep, he dreams. What does he dream about? The ladder going to heaven. He's imagining a world where heaven and earth are kissing each other. He's imagining a world where all the spiritual delights of heaven are coming down to this world. He's imagining a brighter world. This is all as he's going into the state of darkness. He gets to the house of Lavan and he works hard. And he says, well, I'm going to build my life. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to make something out of this thing. He finds four wives. He gives birth to 12 children or more. The girls as well. All unexpected. All happening outside of Israel, away from his family, in exile. He's building the future of the Jewish people over there. It's even brought down in the Midrash. The Midrash asks, <laughs> strange question. What did Yaakov do all night? That's the Medrash's question. Now, it's a strange question because what do you mean, what did he do all night? Either he was working very hard. It says clearly he didn't sleep very much. And he had, eventually, a lot of wives and kids to take care of. So what do you mean, what did he do all night? But that's the Medrash's question. And the Medrash answers, you know what he did all night? He sang the 15 Shir Hamalot songs. In Tehillim, chapter 120 to 135, we have the Shir Hamalot songs. So we think we know that, that they were composed by David Amelech, but it could be some of them or all of them were actually composed already earlier by Yaakov. And the whole night he's singing Shia Malot. What's Shia Malot? A song of a sense. He's thinking about a beautiful world. He still has hope, even though he's in a state of prison. Unbelievable. That's Yaakov. And now after 22 years, Yaakov says, you know what? Maybe it's time to come back. Maybe Esau has forgiven me. Maybe... Even though my son set 22 years ago and I haven't had contact with my family and I've been in exile, I've been harassed by Lavan, maybe it's time for the sun to rise. Let's go back. And he starts to travel back with his family. And as he's going back, he leaves some items at the other side of the river. He crosses the river and there the angel of death meets him. The angel of Aesop. And wants to kill him. And he says to himself, oh my gosh, I thought the sun is ready to rise. And I'm still in a state of darkness. I'm still, still trying to kill me. And he wages a fierce fight, a wrestle against this angel. And in this fight, he's injured. And he's limped, right? He gets a, a, his thigh is dislocated, which is why we don't eat from the Gidan Asher, from the animal nowadays. He, he, he's hurt badly in this fight. But he doesn't give up. And he fights strong. And he knows what's at cost over here, what's at stake over here. His family, the future of the Jewish people. And he wins. And it's at that moment. He doesn't give up when God makes the sun rise. The Torah says the sun rose for him now. And he marches back with his family, back to Israel. This is all what Rabbi Kiva is telling Rabbi Gamliel and his friends in the meat market. Our sun has set decades earlier. The Romans, what they did to us, the sun has clearly set. Look what's happening around us. Jews are being killed and persecuted. And we have no homeland. But let's learn from Yaakov. Even in the darkest of moments, he dreams about this heaven. He dreams about the ladder to heaven. He's singing Shira Ma'alot. He's singing songs of ascent, which are elevating his neshama. He's, he's on a high. He's on a spiritual high. He's full of hope. He's full of optimism. He's full of encouragement. And he's working hard and he knows one day the sun will rise as long as we fight hard. As long as we don't get duped by love on us. We have to remain vigilant. We have to remain clever. We have to protect ourselves. We have to remember. Keep, keep our faith strong. Keep our connection to Hashem strong. Keep our prayers strong. And being protecting ourselves and connecting with the Torah and Hashem. We learn from Yaakov. Eventually hang in there and the sun will rise. You may get injured right before the sun rises, but it will rise for you. You should know that it's brought down in Holy Svarim that there's a connection between Akiva and Yaakov. In fact, the letters are the same. Akiva and Yaakov, except for one Aleph, but it's mainly the letters are the same. And Yaakov sings, in darkness, and Akiva laughs in darkness. And you laugh and you sing and you let go when you're full of that hope and that smile and that up. It's the same idea. And it's brought down that 
that uh, Akiva was in fact a reincarnation of the soul of Yaakov. So when Akiva is sharing this teaching, it's not because he made it up, it's because it's who he is and he inherits it from Yaakov. And that's how he restores life and hope and joy to Rabbi Gamliel, to other rabbis. Let's make this wedding. We have to make a wedding. You're going to ask, but what's going to be in the future? One thing we know for sure. We don't know who's going to be around in the future. But we know that life and love and truth and hope and the Jewish people and the Torah will forever be around. That we know. And that's been proven throughout history. And therefore, we should laugh. Now, one more piece of the puzzle. I want to emphasize one more thing. Let's see where we are in time. Okay. This is not... Uh, what we would say, if we would summarize Yaakov, uh, uh, Rabbi Akiva up until this point, is we might say that Rabbi Akiva is the archetypal optimist in life. Others are realists or pessimists, and he's the optimist, which is true. And he brings comfort. And they say, Akiva, you have comforted. Akiva, you have comforted us. It's more than that. Akiva is not just an optimist. When we talk about the word optimist, we may think the optimist is the dreamer. Whether it's going to be true, it's not going to be true, at least you, you could dream, right? So the optimist, well, it might or might not be true, but at least you live with a sense of hope. But that's not the case. Rabbi Akiva was not an optimist. He was, in fact, a realist. His laughing, his attitude, his lesson from Yaakov was real. And I'm going to tell you why. This is, this is a step deeper. This is very deep. There's a very famous question that's asked. We know that the Medrash tells us that God also fulfills all the Torah, all the mitzvot. Right? In other words, not like a king who gives commands to others but doesn't do it himself. He gives commands to the servants, but he, God, when he gives a mitzvah, it means do what I do. The verse says, Magid Devarav Yaakov, God teaches his instructions to his children. The reason why he tells us to do the mitzvah is because he also does them. So God does all the mitzvah as well. Okay, here's the big question. In Jewish law, there is a prohibition against destroying a holy site. The temple, a synagogue, you know how to destroy them. You can't even bring it. Uh, the, the, the Rambam, the, the Talmud says, a tiny chip of the Mizbeach, a tiny chip of the walls of a temple, you're not allowed to. I remember growing up in Australia, there was the old buildings of the campus where the synagogue was, and then they were destroying some of the old buildings. They built beautiful new buildings, but there was a question so there was a, in one of those old buildings, there's a, a, matzah, a matzah oven. And that room was used as a matzah bakery. So the rabbi at the time ruled, you can destroy the whole building, but the matzah oven has to stay there. So up until today, there's these beautiful new buildings, gymnasiums, uh, stuff. And there's this one, like four by five brick edifice of the matzah oven that was never destroyed. It's still there. So the law is, you know, not destroy a temple or a synagogue. No. Does God fulfill that law? God went ahead and destroyed two temples. He violated his own law. So you're going to say, it wasn't God that destroyed the temples. But give me a break. It was the Babylonians. It was the Romans. Let them be accountable. Don't blame God on this thing. It's true it was the Romans and the Babylonians. However, let me tell you what God himself said. God says as follows. He took full responsibility for it. He prophesied through Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah the prophet. God said, Behold, I shall dispatch the nations of the north and the Bukhanetzar, king of Babylonia, my servants, and I shall bring them upon this land and its inhabitants. I shall deliver this city in the hands of the king of Babylonia. That's what God told Yirmiyahu. I'm asking, I'm authorizing for this whole thing to happen. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, the Romans, Titus, the Vespasian, they were just the tools that did it for me. But I authorize it. No? How could you authorize the destruction if it's not allowed? It's against Jewish law. Big question. So what's the answer? The answer is as follows. There is one scenario when you're allowed to destroy a temple 
or a synagogue. When is that? Ah? When you're not destroying it, but you're renovating it. What's the difference between destruction and renovation? Destruction is you want to bring it down, you want to, your point is it should be a mess. Renovation means I want to build something more beautiful. Now, to achieve that, you first have to bring it down. But when you're bringing it down, it's not for destruction purposes, it's for improvement purposes. God destroys temple number one and temple number two, not because he was bringing destruction to us, but because he was bringing renovation, because he has a plan to bring improvement. What's the renovation he's doing? Temple, temple number one was a man-made structure. Lasted for 410 years. Can't last forever. Temple number two, again, a man-made structure. 420 years. God says temple number three is going to be the ultimate redemption where there's going to be no more exiles after that. It's going to be a time when the absolute truth and the absolute light of Hashem will be revealed in this world. It's going to be the eternal redemption. And that temple will be a God-built or God-blessed temple and it's going to last forever. That's what we believe in. The end of days will be a redemption without any more exiles or destruction after that. In other words, when we see destruction in our lives, we fail at something, we lose a job, chas v'shalom, a tragedy in the home, an issue in a relationship. So we could look at it two ways. You could look at it as destruction. And for that reason, you have to cry. And you think, maybe this is over. When Yaakov left his home, he could have thought, that's it. I, I thought I got the blessing. I thought I'm going to be the future of the Jewish people, but I'm away from my parents. I'm away from my family. I'm never going to find a wife in Haran. It was a dream. I thought, I thought, but it didn't happen. Or you say, God doesn't make any mistakes and God doesn't bring distractions. God's not a destroyer. God's a builder. He's an improver. He's renovating over here. And in order to make a nicer edifice, have to get rid of what exists there now. So if something is, if there's a crack in your life, and if there's something that's, a, if something that's not working out, or if there's a failure, or there's a downfall, maybe it's because we're creating space for something newer and nicer and better to exist. We say, every downfall, in order to have the ultimate aliyah to go up, you have to go down a little bit. If I say jump, you're standing, and so if I say don't bend your knees and just jump, you can't, try it. You want to jump high? Bend lower. The lower you bend, the higher you can jump. That's the principle. There is a very famous mashal, a very famous uh, metaphor of the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov spoke about, in Yiddish, it's called Shvindotrep. You know what Shvindotrep means? Ah, Yiddish. It's a spiral staircase. And the Baal Shem Tov said, what's a spiral staircase? Let's say I'm standing at the bottom, right? And I want to get to the top. The top is up there. I can see the top. But it's not a straight line to get there. A regular staircase, I'm here. The top is there. That's my goal. And I go straight towards it. A spiral staircase is different. You go up. You start traveling towards the destination. But then you turn around. Now your back is towards the destination. So you could think to yourself, hold on a minute. I thought I'm getting closer because I'm going higher. But now I find myself, I can't even see it anymore. It's concealed from me. What happened? No, keep going. You are getting closer even if you can't see it. Come back around. Ah, oh, I see it again. And now I'm in a closer place than I was earlier. Keep going. Again, the same thing happens. I thought I'm getting closer and higher and I can't see it anymore. I'm in a state of darkness once again. No, no. And then, when you get to the highest point, right before the end, right before that last turn, when you've done all this effort, come all this way, that's like at the darkest point that you're facing again the other way, and you think, it's over, I've made all this effort, i made all this investment, and I can't even see it, I'm in a state of darkness, and we tell you, don't give up now, you've reached the top over here. Of course it's dark, it's always a little bit dark before, that, before the dawn breaks. But then the sun will rise, turn around and you'll get there. Baal Shem Tov explains this as the cycles of life. Life is not a straight staircase. Life goes like this. And when it feels like there's a yurida, there's a downfall, when it feels like there's a destruction, when it feels like there's a darkness, when it feels like there's... It's really, you're just getting closer. 
And to get really close, we have to replace what exists now, because it's the old, out with the old, and in with something new. That's why Rabbi Kiva laughs. Not because he's just an optimist. Not because he's a believer. Not because he hopes and he dreams and he imagines. He understands the spiritual mechanics behind this destruction. It's true. Millions of Jews were killed. It's true. Hundreds of thousands were exiled. It's true. Jewish sovereignty was lost. It's true. The Talmud describes, and we learned it a few weeks ago, the amount of blood that was pouring in the streets and towards the rivers and the gruesome deaths of the martyrs. And so, It's true. It's all true. And Rabbi Kiva could cry, and I'm sure he did cry also. But he also knew to laugh because he also knew that this is the renovation of Hashem. Why is Hashem... You know, it's like a classic Jewish contractor or any contractor here in Miami. You know, you start off a job, but they're very quick to come in and demolish. And then you say, no, when, when are you rebuilding my bathroom? And when, this is part of the job. And then six months later or a year later, it's, right? So that's how it works in Miami. You know, maybe all over the world. So why is God like that? He destroyed this thing 2,000 years ago. You could come a little quicker and rebuild it. I don't know. I don't know. You have to talk to him. But that's the message. I want to end up, I want to tell you a story and then a final lesson. So the story is, they say that there was this young scientist who came up with a a chap. He said, I have an idea. I am going to create a formula to create the strongest glue in the world. Like today we buy these um, uh, gorilla glues, magic glues, or super glues. He had this idea back in the day. This is quite quite some time ago. And he worked on it for many months and did a lot of investment. And he creates his potion. And it comes to test it out, takes the glue, puts it on some surfaces. It doesn't stick. It doesn't hold. It's a very weak paste. It's not a, <laughs> the whole thing was an absolute failure. And all of his investors and all of the, everyone was like making a joke of him. And he's thinking to himself, I just spent so many years of my life and I thought this is going to be my, you know, my breakthrough. And I failed. It didn't work. So what did he do? He could have given up, walked away and said, no, no, he didn't. He said, you know what, I, I want to continue to work with this. Maybe, just maybe I've come up with something that I don't even know about yet. What can I do with what I created? You know what he discovered? That this potion is not at all super glue, but it's a little bit sticky, but not so sticky. No, what can I do with something a little bit sticky, but not so sticky? And he created the original post-it notes. He was the, the original designer of the post-it notes. Now there's many break-off companies that made it also, but the, imagine the papers are together, but they're not together, and you can take it off, and you can put it back on, and stick it on your screen, and stick it on your home, and stick it on your car, and stick it everywhere, right? He created the post-it note. The post-it note was only created because somebody did not walk away when they failed. That's pretty impressive. Every time... And I heard this story every time I write on a post-it note, which is like all the time, I think about it. It's like I keep it on my desk because it's a reminder. So, in conclusion, I wanted to read up about laughter. Mario mentioned laughter. So I searched today, and I found from the Mayo Clinic the health benefits of laughter. And Rabbi Kiva teaches us the spiritual truth of laughter. But now, and there's a whole article about why laughter is so important during COVID as well. But here's what the Mayo Clinic says, that laughter is an unbelievable stress reliever, and there are short-term benefits and long-term benefits. So first of all, I'll give you three benefits of each. It says, um, number one, laughter can stimulate many organs in your body. Laughter enhances your intake of oxygen-rich air, stimulates your heart, your lungs, and muscles, and increases the endorphins that are released by your brain. That's number one. Number two, laughter activates and relieves your stress response. A rollicking laugh fires up and then cools down your stress response and can increase and then decrease your heart rate and blood pressure. The result, a good, relaxed feeling after a good laugh. And finally, it soothes tension. It can also stimulate circulation and aid muscle relaxation, both of which can help reduce some of the physical symptoms of stress. And now, what are the long-term effects of laughter? Number one, it can improve your immune system. Positive thoughts can actually release neuropeptides that help fight stress and potentially more serious illnesses. It can relieve pain. 
It could be its own natural painkiller. It increases personal satisfaction because it can help you cope with more difficult situations. It can help you connect with other people and it can improve your mood. It could fix people's depressions, sometimes even chronic illnesses. It can help lessen your depression and anxiety and make you feel happier. So friends, we've got to do a lot of laughing. It's very hard. We're watching what's going on in Israel. We're watching what's going on around the world. And it's scary. And it's very worrying. And some of us have children there right now or families there. And, it's, it's, and we need to cry. Crying is also important. And we need to shed a tear. We need to pray. We need to do things that help. But we also need to laugh, says Rabbi Akiva. And the laughter itself will help. What did somebody say? Somebody said, laughter shatters all barriers in your ways. Anything negative can get pushed away through a good dosage of laughter. May God bring us a lot of laughter in life. And may they, that pave the way for only blessings of peace, and happiness, good health, and redemption in this world. Good evening. Thank you for joining. L'chaim.